It's not very often that I do what I'm about to do today. You can kick up the lights a little bit. Um, I feel this release to share something that I know will shake up the fabric of our community, but it's truth. And so if we're not going to preach the truth in a time when truth is desperately needed, then what are we doing here? That's my question. What are we doing here? But I have to preface this because we're all human. If, I was just, if, if it was all just a spiritual deal, then uh, we would be all perfect in the room and we'd be good. So um, I'm going to preface this by giving some background and then hang on to your hats because it's about to come hot and heavy. Luke 8 verse 16 says this, no one when he has hit, lit a lamp covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light for nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Now, this is the verse for everyone in the room including myself because I'm preaching this to myself this morning. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. The way we hear determines what we receive, and what we receive and the posture of our heart in which we receive it determines whether it lasts or not. So we have to prepare our hearts to hear the word and our heart preparation, the posture of our heart has to be right with the Lord, right with the word for that truth to actually take root and be lasting, okay? It has to be lasting. So what I'm asking you to do this morning is to hear what the Lord has to say through an imperfect communicator, but I want you to hear it because it's strong and it will change your life. It will change your life. You see, this is Thanksgiving week, and everyone is going to be with family of some sort, even if it's just two of you. You'll be with family. And, uh, and in this hour that we live, now, by the way, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that the Lord looked down through the annals of time from eternity past into eternity future, and he put time in there that we'd be in. Thank goodness that we're not in eternity yet, because then all the flaws that we have would last forever. Thank the Lord, we're not there yet. So he's gonna purify us, then we go into eternity. But here's the thing, that he looked down through the annals of time and he said, I want you to be on the planet, in this city, in this region, for this day. Now, if you've been given that and you know that, then you know that there's a deeper purpose of you being here than just to take up space. And what we're going to do is we're all going to go to families' houses. We're going to go to places. Maybe they're coming to your house. We're going to go and everyone is going to have an opinion. The chuckles, they're getting bigger. It's getting louder. Uh, everyone has an opinion about everything. Right? Everybody has an opinion. And there's only one opinion that matters. And it's not yours. And it's not theirs. It's his. And so whenever I address this topic today, I want you to hear my heart. I want you to hear where I'm coming from, and I want you to share this with as many people as you can, because I believe it's anointed for this moment in time. And so find it, get the recording, send it out. It's going to help a bunch of people. So there's going to be families, there's going to be discussions. There's going to be opinions. And what I want you to do is I want you to take every thought captive and hold it to the obedience of Christ's opinion. You see, because the enemy is going to be fooling around with Turkey. And he's going to be trying to convince you that, uh, that he knows correctly. So there's a weightiness upon the earth right now. I'm getting into it, so buckle up. There's a weightiness upon the earth right now that is obvious to everyone. But it's not obvious as the cause of what that is 
that's only revealed to some people. And so everyone's gonna be talking and conversing and complaining and having opinions and, and speaking derogatory toward good people and speaking derogatory toward bad people, but they're all people and Jesus loves everyone. And so you're gonna hear all this and the reason why you're gonna hear all this nonsense in your family gatherings this week is because there's a weightiness upon the earth in this season and people are trying to define the origin. Come on, come on. I'm telling you, you better wake up. You're on the front line on Thursday. I, I can't tell you how fired up I am and if, if you don't get fired up, I'm gonna take this word and go somewhere where the wood's dry and ready to be lit on fire, I'm just telling you. There's a weightiness in the world and people are searching in their heart. They're trying to reason with themselves to figure out what the weightiness is from. What is the cause of the weightiness? And I'm telling you that the enemy has an agenda. This is all straight from the pit of hell. The enemy has an agenda to derail what God wants to do upon the earth. And there are people, maybe even you, that will partner in your words with what the enemy wants to be done and you're gonna establish it right in your house. Do you realize that prophecy after John the Baptist, so you had all the prophets of old, they were here saying the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. Then you have John the Baptist and he's saying the Messiah is here. That was a very short window of prophetic time. And then it got released after Jesus and now we're, we're in the prophetic time when we're pointing back to what Jesus did and saying that is coming in the future. So if you're hearing prophecy about negative things about how we're gonna be obliterated, it's not of the Lord. And you better not be spreading it. He speaks good things of things that Jesus has done and releases it into your life today. So if you come into agreement, whether in thought, in word, or in your heart, with a negative thing that is being spoken today, then you're wrong. Now, those people that speak the negative things, they'll get 10 million views on, on YouTube. They're gonna get a lot of things because people wanna hear bad stuff. It's just the truth. But we're bearers of light. We're bearers of good news. And so my challenge at the beginning of this today is, is that you're going to be put into a spot, whether you like it or not, where you're gonna to have to choose whether you agree with what Jesus says or whether you agree with what the evil agenda says. Now, I'm not just gonna leave it the evil agenda. We're gonna call it out. So let's just start with that. This evil agenda that is sweeping our nation and around the world is affecting people in this room. Affecting people watching this. And I wanna tell you this morning that this, this evil agenda from the pits of hell is affecting you and you, you used to not know about it. You used to be oblivious to what the enemy was doing but today you're, you're officially on notice that the enemy is after you. He is, he's after you. Now, you may say, well, you're, you're talking around in circles. Well, here it is. And you gotta hear me clearly. There is a mandate that is sweeping our country. It's not law, it's a mandate. It's a mandate. Yeah, we won't go into the definition of that, but there's no teeth in it unless they take your pocketbook, which is what he's trying to do in this hour. And so the, the, the vaccine mandate, now hear my heart, whether you got it, whether you don't, I'm totally cool with you. You got your own choice. We live in America, do what you want, okay? I am not saying anything about the vaccine. What I'm saying is this mandate that you either take the vaccine or you don't have a job. You take the vaccine, you can't fly on a plane. You take the vaccine, you can't enter a public building. You take the vaccine, you can't buy food at Amazon. You, it's an evil agenda. Like, like if we're not awake to that yet, you better get awake because he's calling the church awake right now. So this mandate I'm talking about the mandate, not the vaccine. Got me? Everybody hear clearly. If you want it, get it. If you don't, don't. I'm not gonna tell you either way. I have my own opinion on it, but that'll stay up here. But what I'm here to tell you is, is that the mandate is from the pits of hell. 
It's from the pits of hell. So the mandate, bad, vaccine, whatever you choose. If you hear me clearly, you can take this out of context however you want on social media, whatever. I'm saying, do whatever you want with the vaccine. Mandate, bad thing. Now, many of you would say, we're a freedom people. We love freedom, and you're going to shout back at me because I love freedom too. But we're not a freedom people. You may think you're a freedom people, but you shouldn't be a freedom people. You should be a Jesus people because Jesus is freedom. And if we hang our hat on being free, then we can lose it in an instant. You're not, you're not hearing me this morning. I'm telling you, if you hang your hat on living in a free country, that can be taken away in an instant. But if you hang your hat on loving Jesus, who is freedom, you'll have it forever. Okay? That's what we have to understand this morning. We have to understand that the mandate, pits of hell, a lot of things that are going on, directly assignments of hell, totally get it. We understand it. And we didn't think that the, the end of the end would be fun. But it does give us a platform. It gives us a platform. Some people are going to shy away from the platform. Other people are going to stand on the platform. We're going to be a house that stands on the platform. And we're going to share what the truth is about this. So if you turn with me to Matthew 6. So you're hearing my heart this morning. I'm not saying anything about the vaccine. I want you to know that forcing people to do anything goes back to the Old Testament. Just go read what happened. You become slaves. Should I say that? You become slaves to a dictator. If he's forcing you to do something, you're a slave. If you go all the way back to Egypt, what happened? Forced them to work, forced them to do this, controlled all their meals, did all their stuff. Are you comparing us to Egypt? No, actually, I think some parts of it were worse off. But what I'm saying is, is that the mandate, evil. Okay. So, Matthew 6, 25. I'm going to read this. Actually, I'm going to start in 33 because you know that one. And it's on my shirt, so you better know that one. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? His righteousness. This isn't something that you're doing on your own. This is his righteousness. It's a capital H. We're seeking his righteousness and all these things will be added. And you've heard this because you've been in church for a long time or maybe you haven't heard it before, but we're going to go read what all these things means in the beginning verses. Verse 25, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Well, there are 50% of the room. We got to get over the first line. How many of you have worried about your life in the last 24 hours? Right? So it says, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, how many of you thought about lunch? Shouldn't be on your agenda. What you will drink, nor about your body. Man, come on. Some of us have been thinking about our bodies lately. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? If you're looking at this debauchery from hell in your house, you're looking at it because you've got to make a decision. You got to make a decision. Uh, well, I leave 30 years of doing what I've loved to do because I'm not going to do that. If that's what you're doing, this verse is for you. Which of you, by worrying, can add a cubit to your stature? We've got a whole lot of people worrying right now. And it's giving you zero other than an open door for the enemy to walk into your life and control you. Now remember that. When we worry, we open the door for the enemy to come into our life and control us. I'll get to that later. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, he, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? 
Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, and what shall we drink, and what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need all the time. This isn't a curveball to the Lord. People are making this out like the Lord doesn't have the answer to what you're thinking. He's already done all this stuff. He's got the answer. In fact, it's in here. We'll see it in a second. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now that should give you peace. You should read Matthew 6 and be like, I got this down. I seek the kingdom. All this stuff's added to me. I'm walking in faith. I'm going to make the decisions that the Lord wants me to make, and I'm not going to worry. But how many of you does that actually work every single day? Well, we got to renew our mind to get there, but I'm just saying we're human. And so when you see a mandate come down the line that says either take this thing or don't work here anymore, or take this thing and you can't, or you can't buy food, then we really got to go back to understand what the Lord was saying because it's in red. He knows our needs. He knows our decisions. He knows our struggle. He knows our, what we have to do every single day. He already knows. It's not a surprise to him. We often claim things in scripture, but we don't actually clarify the context of the scripture. So we say, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us, but we don't take into the context that he's saying everything you've ever needed from the time you were born naked till the time you die naked, all of it, he's got it under control. See, we try to appropriate scripture, but we don't understand exactly how it comes about to be, and so we're not in clarity of what the Lord is saying. You see, we try to appropriate something, we say, I'm gonna claim Matthew 6, but we don't understand what, it's, what it really means. So we, we try to claim it, and yet, if we really understood that Jesus already lived this out, you're not in a new place. Jesus already did all this. And then he says, look, I take care of all these things and I've been where you are. So if you're gonna claim this scripture, Matthew 6, you have to understand that I've already walked through it, so come with me and we'll walk through it together. You're not alone. You're not alone. Luke 22. Luke 22. I'm gonna jump to a lot of scripture. I'm gonna make this, prove this to you, but we're gonna do a lot of scripture this morning. Luke 22, 27. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? It is not he who sits at the table, yet I am among you as the one, capital O, better be capital in that one, yeah, one who serves. You say, what in the world does this have to do with the mandate and shots and vaccines and all that? When the Lord was on the earth, he is the king of glory. He left heaven, he came to earth, and everywhere we see Jesus in the scripture, in a difficult time, he's never the one sitting at the head of the table commanding what's happening. So why do you think you can? Why do we think we can? He's never the one. No, how does he show up in every scripture when there's pressure there's tension there's just debauchery all around how does Jesus show up how can I serve you how can I serve you how can I serve you he eagerly desires to be with us not to command us but to be with us and to serve us That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He's the king of glory. He's the last king that is standing. The last one. 
And he, the creator of the universe, wants to be with you. Say, with me. Not your neighbor. Yes, he wants to be with them too, but sometimes we push all of these things off to the person that's next to us. He wants to be with them, but he doesn't want to be with me because I've got flaws. No, he wants to be with all of us, and he's not coming as a pastor who bangs the Bible over your head to try to fix you. No, he's coming as a pastor who says, listen, we got stuff we got to get done. Let's get cleaned up. Let's go. I'm telling you in this hour, we're finding out through the pressure of the debauchery from hell, we're finding out who's got the, who's got the goods. Okay. Matthew 26. Got all the tabs on here this morning. Matthew 26. We're going to start in verse 17. Matthew 26, verse 17. Now, Miss Lisa, could you, Pastor Lisa, could you give me those real quick? Thank you very much. There's communion. We're going to read about communion. There's communion right there. I'll explain that later. Matthew 26, verse 17. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Their heart was to prepare a place for Jesus to come and receive the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, these, these guys... We're in chapter 26. They've seen a lot, right? They've seen a lot. And they come to Jesus and they say, listen, master, where would you like us to prepare a place for you? Because that's what we want to do. We want to prepare a place for you. Now, we make church about a lot of things. Religion makes church about a lot of things. The reason why we're here is to make a place for him to come and eat with us. That's what all this is for. That's it. Because when he comes to eat with us, things change. Okay? Verse 18. And he said, red letters, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So there are a called out people who are there to prepare a place for the Lord to come and sit and sup with you. I believe this is one. I believe the summit is a place where people can come where looking like, smelling like, sounding like, whatever mask they're wearing today, they can come in here and they can meet Jesus. And it doesn't matter who's up here. It doesn't matter who led worship. It doesn't matter if we even do worship. They're just gonna come on the property and meet Jesus. Okay, that's our heart. We want to prepare a place for him to come and make his, make his abode and be so when people come in, they don't worry about who's up here. They just worry about meeting him. Okay, 19. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that means that his work is done. So when he comes into the room, he sits down with them to eat with them. Now, I probably eat way too much fast food. In fact, I know I do. And the reason is because I don't sit down long enough to actually eat a meal. Ask the guys who went with me to Florida. We just go, 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 go. So here's the thing. The Lord isn't going to sit down and eat with you if you're not sitting. I don't think he's going to throw a biscuit at you as you go by and say, here, eat with me. Am I wrong? They had to prepare a place for him to come and dine with them so that he could fellowship with them, so that he could be with them, so that he could impart to them. 
So he sat down with the 12. Now this is where it's going to get heavy, so just hang on. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The weight of that statement with 12 dudes that have been with you and seen everything and you love them, you've done life with them, you've been with them forever and you stand, the first words after he sits down with them is one of you dudes is gonna betray me. I want you to feel his heart. Can you imagine how hard it was to say that? Imagine how hard it was for him to say, those people that have been with me for a long time, one of you is just gonna throw me under the bus. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Am I going to be the one? He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Think about this, guys. This is so good. This is so good. He wants to sit with you and have communion with you all the time. So you have to prepare a place for that. If you're always running, he's not going to sit with you. We, we got that foundation. He says to them, one of you is going to betray me. In the intimacy of time with Jesus, he'll call you out. You see, that's why a lot of people don't want time with Jesus. Jesus. Because they like their dysfunction and if I sit with Jesus, he'll call me out of my dysfunction and maybe I'm making decisions out of my own flesh and not out of what he wants me to do and so I can't be with him. But I'm here to tell you that in the moment that he says one of you will betray me, Jesus was feeling pain. It says that he lived on the earth and experienced everything as we did but without sin. That means that in this moment, whatever emotion you can tag on to what he said, he was probably feeling it. Because you feel something different, Brett, than I feel whenever I read this scripture. Pastor Sean, same thing. We we all we all feel something different. Well, he felt all of that in the moment. Are we in his shoes yet? Are we in his shoes yet? So I'm here to tell you that no matter what you're facing today, maybe you're being betrayed by your company. Maybe you're being betrayed by family members. Maybe you're being betrayed or you have been betrayed in the past and you've never dealt with it. He knows your pain. He was there. So we got hundreds of thousands of workers in the medical field that are in pain right now. And they're searching for an answer. They're searching for an answer. And if we as the church can't point them to the answer, what hope do they have? And the answer isn't what you can conjure up in your mind that makes everything work out in the budget. Come on. If we're going to, okay. If we're going to cave at this, how are you going to do it when there's a gun to your head? I'm just saying. If we're going to cave at a shot, what, what in the world The church has been born for greater things than this, people. If we don't have the answer for this, the world is lost. The world is lost. They have no hope. And if the church stays within the four walls and pontificates every day, they have no hope. But I'm here to bring you hope. I'm here to bring you hope. It must have been so painful for him to acknowledge the betrayal openly. He was feeling it. He knew it. But it was painful for him to acknowledge it openly because they were so dear. Now, here's the thing. As I said, I love freedom. I think think every generation has to figure out how we're going to keep it. But... I love freedom, but I'm not a freedom person. I'm a Jesus person, and then in Jesus, I get freedom. So that's how we're going to keep this, okay? If, you, if you've thought about just waving the red, white, and blue, that's great, as long as you've waved the Bible first, and you've been in his presence to wave the red, white, and blue, okay? So you know where I'm at with that, but here's what I'm, I'm here to tell you, is that 
we are walking into a season in which betrayal is inevitable. Every day you're going to be betrayed. A company that you always went to is not going to allow you to come in. Or maybe they are. A business that you've given your life to is going to say, I choose money over you. Let's just be real. The whole mandate for nurses and doctors and hospital workers, it's all about money. It's all about money. It's not about whether you have it. If you, if you have the vaccine, you can still get it, transmit it, and still get sick. If you don't have the vaccine, you can still get it, transmit it, and still get sick. It's all because they're holding back the Medicare and Medicaid money from the hospitals. They're looking at their bottom line saying 80% of our money comes from Medicare and Medicaid. I'd rather choose the money that's coming from the government over the people that have given their lives to my organization. And what that is going to end up in is death for the organization and a death to our healthcare system, which is exactly what the, the agenda of the enemy is so that they can get one world government and one world healthcare. Okay. And we won't edit that out, because that's the truth. That is the truth. Now, I want to take you to this moment as we continue reading, because you're going to find out that we're all at a place here where we need to really hear the Lord. The Son of Man, verse 24, the Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Get this next line. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. The turmoil in hell that he is going to pay is going to make him wish he'd never been born. Ooh. In the presence of Jesus, and he's calling you out and saying, the pain and sorrow you're going to experience in hell for what you're about to do, you're going to wish you'd never been born. Then Judas who was betraying him, answered him and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. I want to open this scripture up to you because it's, it's for real. Jesus' life was always yielded to what the Father said. Do we understand that? And scripture says, I only do what I see the father do I only say what I hear the father say so we know that that is truth so if he only did what he heard the father say if he only said that then what he said was true amen and it says that he in verse 24 the son of man goes just as it is written of him so it's not just what the father was speaking in the moment Jesus says look there was something written about what's about to happen and I have to walk it out and I'm obeying the word of the Father. And so here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm walking this deal out. And so, somebody here is going to betray me. And then Judas says, yo, is it me? And Jesus said, well, you said it, not me. Now, I want to break this down. The heart of the Father is so good. And he knows where you're at right in this moment. You're debating retirement. You're debating how are we going to pull this off? How are we going to make the car payment? He knows. He cares. He's a good pastor. He cares. He's your pastor. I don't want to be your leader. I want to be the lead follower. I want to follow him. This dialogue between Judas and Jesus, oftentimes I think we read it way too quick through it. Because there's some keys in here that we have to understand about what happened in those moments. Begin to read scripture. This is a, a tip for you. Begin to read scripture and just look at Jesus' response to situations. That's really what he thought. You read it too quickly. I read it too quickly. We read too quickly and then we miss that Jesus' response to that situation is the only thing that matters. Not the heart of the people and all that. That's great. But what he said about it really matters. And he says, oh, you said it, not me. Why? Why did he say that? It's so good. Jesus said this to Judas. You have said it, not me, but you've said it, so it must be true. Why did he say that? Because Jesus never accuses you. There's only one accuser on the planet. It's Satan. Jesus isn't entering that game. 
Jesus could have very easily said, oh yeah, you're a loser and you're, you're gonna betray me. No, he didn't say that. He said, oh, you said that. Hmm. You said that. He will never accuse you. No matter what your decision is on this mandate, no matter what your decision is, he's not gonna judge you. He's not gonna accuse you. That's not who he is. But you have to have it in your heart that you've taken this to the Lord. That's it. So we have hundreds of thousands of people that are trying to look at their budget, the new car payment, you know, that, that new Telluride that's in the garage. We've got to figure out how we're making that $600 payment. How is all this going to work? And if it doesn't work, oh man, I need to go against what I thought because I've got to make that work. Many people in this season are going to look at their bank account and make decisions about the future of their life instead of going to the Lord. Does that resonate with anybody we just read about? Judas was thinking more about his bank account than he was about Jesus. I know it's strong, just bear with me. So there's only one accuser. We got that established. Satan, he's always accusing, always accusing. Sort of lame that that's all he does. When the enemy is prowling around the earth, he always leaves a trail. He leaves a trail. James 3.16 says this, For where there is envy and strife and confusion, there is an evil work afoot. If there's, if there's envy, if there's strife, and if there's confusion, Satan's somewhere there. Let's root him out. Let's root him out. Let's root him out. Now, for those of you who haven't been here in a long time, you can go back to a sermon that I preached about communism is Satan's last stand. That's a good one for you. Because it is. And the people with demonic agendas are trying to bring it as fast as possible. And the only way, let's, let's just break this down. The only way you can learn new truth about the scripture is to sometimes unlearn things that weren't true. Okay? It works the opposite way because there's always a counterfeit to the Lord. So the counterfeit to the Lord is the enemy wants you to unlearn things that are right and believe things that are wrong. So that he wants you to unlearn freedom. He wants you to unlearn personal property rights. He wants you to unlearn that your body is yours, a temple of the Holy Spirit, and I have a right to say what's put in it. He wants you to forget all that. He wants you to come over to this part that says, I'm more worried about my pocketbook than I am about what I've been convicted of. I know it's strong, I know. But what we, what we have to understand is where the world is in is in evil and envy and strife and confusion, the the devil is there. He's all around us right now. He's all around us right now. And thank the Lord we live where we live. But he's all around us. Cities are burning this morning. It's not what the Lord wants. So this is the season I believe we're in. As a body, as a region, as a country. And how we navigate this season is going to determine the outcome of the next season. There's a lot of weight on this, on this season in the church. And if we're not going to talk about it, then why are we even here? There's weight on your decision in this hour. Everybody has a right to their own decision. At least that's what the word says. I mean, you don't see that on the news, but. The way we are in this season, the decisions that we make, how we deal with everything that's facing us in this hour is gonna determine the outcome of the next season. And I'm telling you, those who are prophesying doom will see it because they're agreeing with it. Those who prophesy what the Lord says about this season are gonna see great things. And the wealth of the wicked is gonna transfer to the righteous and thank you, Lord, the things that have been promised will come. But it's gonna only come when we have a different posture. You see, whenever I first heard about this, I was like, I'm just going to be open with you. I was like, oh, oh this is going to be bad. Uh, we have 
more guns in this country. That's why China hasn't come here yet. They come in a virus, but not in a plane because they know we're going to take them out. So we won't edit that out either. Um, so, so here's the thing. They won't come on our land because they know they're done. So what we're seeing around the world is the countries who have given up their guns are the ones who are in lockdown who can't go to get groceries. So keep your guns. And make sure you can shoot and hit something. Yeah. Whew. So here's where we're at. It's funny. It's not so funny. But until, and, and whenever I heard it, I was like, ah, oh, this is going to end horribly, blah, blah, blah. And I was prophesying doom. Not good. So I had to do something. I had to enter the situation as Jesus entered every hostile situation that he ever came in. How can I serve you? You see, because what I want to do is completely the opposite, and we'll just get a bunch of caravans together and go take care of it. That's what I want to do in my flesh so bad. But Jesus is not calling us to that in our flesh. He's calling us to say, how can I serve you? Now, do we serve the enemy? No, Jesus never served the enemy. In fact, he let the enemy call himself out. When we begin to serve in the way that the Lord wants us to serve about this mandate or any other nonsense from hell, the enemy will reveal himself and he'll call himself an idiot. He'll expose himself because that's what he does. He leaves a trail everywhere he goes. So I'm here to tell you this morning that the solution to the mandate problem isn't that we rise up and riot. The left knows how to do that very well. And we don't burn buildings, we don't shoot people. We serve. And we come to the world and say, we have an answer for you. Jesus said, I have an answer for you. I wanna be with you. I wanna be in your presence. And in your presence, you'll find peace and joy and hope. And yet many in the church are, are prophesying and preparing for this great battle. Listen, we're called to serve with a towel. And let the enemy expose himself. And then the whole world will see. So what does serving with a towel mean? What does, in this practical application in this moment, what does serving with a towel mean? Serving with a towel means that we repent of every thought that we had that wasn't of serving with a towel. Serving with a towel means that we humble ourselves, we lay down our righteous anger and our frustration. We don't make decisions off of what we see in the natural, we make decisions on what he says. And when we make that decision, we serve. We serve. And I'll be honest, my flesh is to do more target practice. Like, I want to be good, man. I want to know. But my spirit, the thing that is 100% perfect today, has to break through into my soul and into my body and say, I'm here to serve. And I have an answer. And the answer is freedom. The answer is love. The answer is hope. The answer is joy. But it's none of those things at first. The answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. The answer isn't your bank account. The answer is Jesus. And when you make him a priority, he will change your world. So we took communion last week. And I said before we took communion that if you take communion with the wrong heart, things can happen. Bad things can happen. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11 says you could die. I want you to think about the story that I just read to you. It says if you're not right in your heart, go fix it with your brother before you take communion. Because if you take communion, you shall surely die. You could die. Okay? So here's what happens. When we take communion in the wrong way, it can really adversely affect us. And I want you to hear this again. 
Then the Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man whom the Son of Man has betrayed. It would, it would have been good for that man not to have been born. And then right after verse 25, it goes to verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to the disciples. Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And what did Judas do? He took communion and Satan entered his heart. He was in the presence of the Lord with a wrong heart and Satan had a doorway. And I'm asking you church, we have to come to a point where our heart is so broken for the Lord that it has no agenda other than him. It doesn't matter what the paychecks look like. It doesn't matter if I've spent 30 years in that company. It doesn't matter. All that matters is my heart is broken for him and him alone. All the other stuff will figure itself out. Because it says in Matthew 6, the lilies clothe themselves. But seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We've got this mentality that all these things will be added because I do what I want to do and we'll seek the kingdom last. And he's saying, seek ye first the kingdom. I find it very interesting that Jesus in this hour is bringing the guys together and he's saying, hey, I'm going to eat with you. And he brings up bread and wine and he says, this is my body, this is my blood, we've done it, you know it, you, you get it, but I don't know that you get it. Because we've all taken communion with that thing in our heart. Maybe it's an angst towards someone, maybe it's an angst toward what's going on right now. I believe that the Lord in this hour, through our repentance, wants to shut some doors that we've left open for the enemy. The doors that you've left open have left you sleepless, frustrated, angry. Those are never the attributes that I read about Jesus. So they can't be of him because he's never an accuser. So if the things that you're feeling and seeing are not replicated in the life of Jesus, then it's time to repent. I believe he's calling the church in this hour and we've got a short window. And I mean a very short window to repent, to get right, get our heart right, focus on him, and be ready to share the gospel with everyone you see. Because when all of this gets to where it's going, people all around the world are gonna look to you for an answer, and you better have one. So this isn't just repentance for our heart position, it's repentance for our motives, it's repentance for our words. It's repentance for our thoughts. It's repentance in anything that has taken us away from what the Lord says about this situation. You see, I believe that Jesus was like, listen guys, you've watched me teach. You know a lot about me. We're gonna sit down and have dinner together because instead of learning about me, I wanna be in union with you. I want you to experience me. And in this hour, the church is so desperate for an experience with the King of Kings. And if the church isn't willing to submit, if the church isn't willing to repent, then how is the world gonna see Jesus? Because they're looking at us. They're looking at us. And Jesus always came with the towel even though he very rightly could have wore a crown. So in Revelation, it talks about this. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. What's the door? Your heart. He's standing there knocking. Now, I, I can take this and we can turn it towards salvation. Great, I'm not going there this morning. But what I am gonna say is, is that he's standing at the door of your heart and knocking. And he's saying, let me come in. 
Now, have you ever in your life had a guest at your house and they knocked on the door and you weren't ready? Come on. All the wives are like, see? See, he understands. Pastor gets me why, why I'm worried about it. If you've ever had a guest knock at the door and you're not ready, what happens in the next 30 seconds? Pandemonium. Craziness. Run around. Things are getting shoved everywhere, right? Oh, no, somebody's here. You see, he's standing at the door of your heart and knocking, and he doesn't want you to go through stress. He doesn't want you to run around and hide the anger somewhere. Because when you run around and hide the anger that's in your heart, it turns to bitterness. It makes you sick in your body. He says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart today and I want you to let me come in and clean it out so that you can do what I've called you to do. And then I love the scripture that says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. And if everybody in the room and everybody watching online would get this, the church would explode. And I'm not talking about the summit. I'm saying the love of Jesus would explode across the planet. But see, when he stands at the door and knocks, our tendency is to do what we do in the natural, but in the spiritual. I'm not mad about the mandate. I'm just trying to figure it out. No, you've got anger. You've got frustration. You've got turmoil in your heart that's dirty he wants to clean it up he says I want you to be a clean bride I want you to be washed and ready for me when I come see he wants to he wants us to feast on him but he wants to feast on our worship so when we honor him he comes and he says feast on me and he feasts on us. You see, I had someone call me this week and say, I didn't take communion because I have this thing in my heart. And I don't understand all that you're saying, but I know I couldn't take it. Kudos to you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. Thank you for being mature. Oh, that we all would be that mature. I've got something in my heart. It's not quite right. I've got to figure it out before I take communion. But many people just take communion. And then the back door of their heart is open for everything the enemy wants to slip in. He doesn't want that. He wants us to enjoy his presence. All right? I know it's late. Can I have 10 more minutes? Please? Psalm 23. We're claiming things in scripture that we don't understand. How many of you have ever done Psalm 91? Yes. If you don't understand the, the realization of Psalm 91, then you're claiming something you don't understand, which means it produces no fruit. I'm telling you, this is gonna, this is gonna accelerate what you're, what you're thinking about this. So we claim this for ourselves. Psalm 23, what does it say? What does it say? The Lord is my shepherd. He's a good pastor. He's a good pastor. But I want to go down to something else really quickly. This is written about Jesus. He's lived this whole deal out. And so if you're going to claim scripture, you have to understand who paid for it. And Jesus paid for it. And so if you're going to claim that he's a good shepherd, you have to understand that Jesus was looking at the Father saying, you're a good shepherd. Is he your shepherd in all of these things? Is he? He so wants to be your shepherd. He so wants to knock on your heart and not have you go through all the turmoil of cleaning up. He wants you to surrender to him and to repent of all the dirty things in our hearts. And I want to declare this over you. Would you stand with me? I believe that we don't understand this and I'm going to finish it next week. I believe we don't really understand 
what he means about being a good shepherd. Because we've so attached Jesus to the non-Christian understanding of church, which is that a man stands up front, tells you all he thinks about everything, and you're supposed to take it and do something with it. That's not the church. He wants to really help us understand that he's our shepherd. And I have meetings all week, about every week, I have meetings, morning, afternoon, not normally in the evening, but I'll do those too. I have meetings with people in this house, people from other churches, and they want a shepherd's perspective on their situation. And I'm here to tell you that the only answer that you're gonna be satisfied with is the one that comes from the good shepherd. But what I want you to guard your heart about is, is that the decision about something from the pits of hell is not a decision that you can take lightly or look at your bank account to decide. It's only when you go to the good shepherd and spend time with him. That's the only way that this works. It's the only way that you're gonna be at peace for a long time about your decision. And I believe that today we just have to be really real with ourselves and say, maybe in the past I've taken communion and I've actually opened the door for the enemy to wreck my life and I've been not able to sleep. I'm going back to the doctor for blood pressure medicine. I'm doing all this stuff because I'm so in turmoil about what's going on in the world. And I believe if you lay that down this morning and you just say, listen, I know I'm upset about all that and I just wanna be done with it. I wanna be at peace. And then you take communion. The other disciples that took communion were able to go to the very end because they were at peace with what Jesus said to them. God is searching the earth in this hour. He's saying, I am ready for a people who are gonna lay down their dysfunction and rest in me. They're gonna make me the priority and then they're gonna run to me when it gets tough. Is that you this morning? I wanna ask you, if you have anything in your heart that has been stirred up in this sermon, in this time together, that the Lord has highlighted that you just need to lay down, then I want you to come and do that this morning at the altar. And then I want you, after you've laid it down, I want you to take communion and I want you to go back to your seat and I want you to take it when you feel right about taking it. When you've searched every nook and cranny of your heart to say, there's no thing in me that I can find in this moment that would keep me from taking communion. And then I want you to take communion. And if that means you're here till 1.30, I don't care. But you need to be in his presence. You need to be with him and eat with him and dump everything out. Because what he wants to do in the next season, people, we pray for revival, we don't even get it. You know why? Because that means seven days a week for three years, three services a day in this house. We can't even get the whole church to show up on the same Sunday, let alone that. How can he send it? Why? Because we got things in our heart that keep us from him. Let's get it right this morning. Let's get it right this morning. So come forward as he's playing. We're just gonna take a few minutes. If, if you're not, if you feel like I'm completely clean, I'm totally good, then pray in tongues, okay? You're a part of this. You can't check out on this. And then I want you to come, lay it down, say, Lord, I give you this. This is what you highlighted to me. If he highlighted it to you, it means he's gonna fix it. He never highlights something and then doesn't fix it. That would be torture. Oh, you're broken in this way, but I'm not gonna fix it for six months. No, if he highlights it, he's fixing it. So if he brought it to your remembrance right now, he wants to fix it right now. And that's what he's doing. So as he plays, lights are gonna come down. We're gonna spend a few minutes just in his presence. Come forward, lay it down at the altar, take communion, go back to your seat. Thank you, Lord, we worship you. Come have your way in this place. For you are the King of glory. You have come to free us from the bondage of sin and death, pain. We wanna be pure today. We wanna, we wanna see you, we wanna hear you, we wanna we wanna engage with what you're doing on the planet right now. We don't wanna be the ones that just bring more turmoil. We wanna be the ones who 
who bring a solution. We wanna lead people to Jesus this morning. We wanna, we wanna be so clean of our hearts with you. We wanna be so clean of our minds that we aren't thinking bad thoughts. We're not speaking things that aren't of you. We wanna be silent if that's what it means, but we wanna be bold and silent. Lord, we surrender to you. We give you our brokenness this morning. You've given us a light. We aren't gonna hide it under a bushel. We're gonna open it up for the world to see. Light penetrates darkness. And you've called the church in this hour to penetrate the darkness of the world, not because of thoughts that we have, not because we're so ingenious, but because we're so focused on your presence, because we so wanna be with you, Jesus. Change us today wreck us for the for the things of this world focus us on just being in your presence he says he called you out of darkness into marvelous light lord reveal that light through our broken hearts to the world around us lord give us the hope of nations give us the hope lord you've called this house You've called this house to be a place of prayer. You've called this house to be a place of healing. You've called this house to be a, a launcher of people to the nations, to awaken nations. Lord, do it in us as we purify our hearts before you, that your will would be done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you've been betrayed, he's been where you are. If you've been betrayed, he's felt the pain. If you've been betrayed, he's felt every emotion that you're feeling. And you know what? He says, I am, I am. May we be patient enough this morning that when we surrender everything, we allow the enemy to highlight himself and then we call him out. Every thought that comes into your mind, every emotion that comes upon you, he leaves a trail. He leaves a trail. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We love you. We thank you that you've put us in this position in 2021, the week of Thanksgiving. You've put us here on this planet to be an answer to the darkness of this world. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, I pray an acceleration upon every person who has surrendered to you. Thank you, Lord. God is releasing great encouragement through you. He's releasing the joy that comes from knowing him into you so that you'll release it to the world. No longer will the church be the negative Nelly in the room. We're gonna be the positive people who bring Jesus into the, into the table. He's giving you refreshing and rest. Woo, come on. Some of you have been in so much turmoil, you don't even know what good sleep is. He's giving you rest for your weariness. As I was praying about this morning, I, I, saw, this, I saw this picture that it, it was a pressure release valve, like in a factory where there's all, a lot of pressure. And, uh, and what happened was, the Lord is releasing the pressure valve of your life right now in this moment. He's releasing the pressure valve of your life. And all of that pressure that comes from listening to the enemy more than listening to him, all of it gets released through your heart this morning. He wants you to be free because he is freedom. I saw new opportunities and better places. And I release that over everybody here. Woo, new opportunities, better places. Don't be limited by the mindset of lack. Sometimes the Lord's gonna close a door and open a better one. May not look better right now. It may not look better, but it may be the right choice for you. And the other thing that I saw, we were praying last night on the phone, a pastor friend of mine, and I were praying and he said, picture with me a, a baseball that the skin is taken off and it's just the bands on the inside. And they're all like, 
Anyway, you know what the inside of a baseball looks like. And he said, the Lord right now is pulling on the end of that thing and that ball just rolls away from you and it's just bouncing back and forth because it's unra unraveling, unraveling, unraveling. There's some of you in the house this morning that have had so much grief, so much pain, so much frustration. So you've been warring in your mind. You've been warring in your heart. You've been warring in your body even. You've been warring and warring and warring. The Lord is grabbing a hold the end of that piece of string and it, it's unraveling right now in his presence. And then after it's completely unraveled, he begins to put it back together the right way with all the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven. So Lord, today we submit ourselves to you. We lay down at your feet. We say, come have your way in our lives. Guide us, direct us, give us supernatural wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Help us navigate this, these decisions that have come from the depths of hell. Help us navigate what you want us to do, how you want us to be obedient to your word. Lord, we're gonna take every thought captive, every emotion captive. We're gonna hold it to you before we even open our mouth. But I believe, Lord, that you are gonna give strategies. You're gonna give divine strategies to your church in this hour to be able to produce the kind of church that you want that will be a light to the world. So Lord, we receive that supernatural knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And with that gift and all the other gifts that are being received in this moment, we will not let them lay there and rot. We're gonna use them, we're gonna commit to them, and we're gonna say, Lord, you've opened this door, we're going through the door, we're not asking for apologies, we're not looking over our shoulder for the enemy to try to mess it up. No, we're going straight at it, and we're not apologizing because the kingdom of heaven Sometimes it's time for the church to become violent and take it by force in the spirit. And we're gonna enter into a time of intercession in which the church is gonna take ground that has never been taken before. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, purify our hearts. Purify our hearts, Lord. submit our bodies to you, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, which is our reasonable act of worship. And we will not be conformed to this world, but we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We receive it this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's no hurry. If you go back to your seat, take communion as the Lord leads you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. last week you should take it every day but oh father we stand before you as empty vessels we ask you in this moment to seal upon our heart your seal we take your bread which is your body and we break it and we receive it, Lord, today as a sign that your body was broken for us. And the brokenness that we now feel in the flesh is a lie. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We receive it. Mm, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. The blood that was shed upon the cross for the remission of our sins is still wet on the mercy seat today. It's forever wet. 
but any emotion that you feel about past sin is a lie. So let's listen to what the Lord says and not what we might think, what the enemy whispers to us. Father, we thank you for your blood that you shed for us. We thank you that you are moving and breathing and powerful. We thank you, Lord, that you have every answer to every question that we would ever even think to ask. There's no, no question that you don't already have the answer to. So, Lord, I ask for your people that you would seal upon their heart the wisdom of heaven in the days when the winds are blowing, trying to distract us from your vision. We cover every decision in your blood today. Seal it upon our hearts.